This is Mikhail Beketov. Uh, he died on April 13th, just a month ago. He died in a Moscow hospital um, of a heart failure, but one could actually trace down the injuries that caused his death in, back in 2008. In 2008, in November, he was, he was attacked by unknown assailants, beaten so badly that his both arms and legs were broken, his skull was cracked, he was left in his own courtyard to freeze to death. His uh, neighbors found him the next morning, brought him to hospital, where he stayed several months in coma, underwent several surgeries, part of his brain had to be removed, one leg amputated. In short, he never recovered from that, from that attack. In the newspaper that he was editing, he was highly critical of a local mayor, accusing him publicly of corruption and nepotism and challenging him on his pet project of replacing part of, of the local forest with, uh, with highway. He was warned several times before this event happened, so in 2007, almost a year before, he was attacked, his dog was killed, his car was set ablaze, but he did not stop writing. After the event, a lot of Russian politicians came up and promised quick and swift investigation, and that was in 2008. Nothing ever happened. Actually, the only legal event since, 19, since 2008 was that in 2010, it was Mikhail who was uh, convicted to pay 5,000 rubles to a former mayor for libel. That verdict was later overturned by... Um, by a higher court. It's a horrendous story, but it's not, unfortunately, it's not the only one. And it's a horrendous story of impunity of attacking journalists. Um, the cases are so numerous. There is a whole index that CPJ, I'm sure you know what CPJ is, uh, puts together every year. This is their latest report issued in May this year. These are the countries with numbers of unsolved uh, uh, journalists murders attached to them. Uh, CPJ, by the way, uses a wonderful, um, wonderfully simple um, mechanism to do the calculation and rank 12, worst, 12 countries worst offenders. They take the number of unsolved murders of journalists divided with the total number of population, spend that over a period of 10 years so you can actually get pretty realistic picture how bad countries are doing. You have these 12, out of these 12, Nigeria is the one that just came on the list, so it's a newcomer on the list. Brazil was um, made an absence of one year, but other than that, if you take these two out, here's the stunning data. These 10 countries are here since the index was invented. So nothing ever changes there. Moving from specific countries to a general picture. This, these are UNESCO numbers. Over 600 journalists were killed in the last 10 years. I don't need to say anything here. CPJ also tracks the number of journalists arrested. Last year, 232. Year before that, 179. You see the big difference. And this shows the worst number ever before 2012. So we are actually doing worse than we did in 1996. We are doing worse than we did at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, this is the worst countries, offenders, Turkey 49 journalists arrested, China and Iran. And just one last, last set of numbers. Uh, Freedom House issues every year since 1980s their uh, press freedom report. They, uh, you, they survey 197 countries and territories. They try to make an assessment of how difficult it is for journalists to operate in those countries and how easy it is for the population to access the information. And the report issued for this year says that the world is doing worse than it, the results of the worst in the last 10 years. So we are in this also going backwards. The interesting thing is that if you look at the results by country, 32% of all the countries in the world allow access to their population, free access to information. 32 do not 
they're totally controlled, and 36% is somewhere in between. So they are practically three equal parts. Now, if you look at the same numbers by the population, they are very different. So only 14% of people living on this planet have access to information which is not controlled or influenced by the government, which is a stunning number. And not only is it stunning, but you look historically, this is the worst number that the world ever achieved since 1996. So why did I spend five minutes of your, of your time to show you these numbers? Um, I actually am very alarmed. I think that we, for almost two decades, never did so, so badly. And I think that, at least for me, these, these, these numbers show that we are very, we are going backwards, and we're actually running backwards. Uh, and um, what worries me a little bit is that there's no sense of urgency. No one's talking about this. I would expect that young people are stopping on the street, stopping traffic. That doesn't happen. So, um, finishing that, I want to now switch the gears. I want to switch the, the, the tone of this presentation from this is a horrible situation. I think I've described it into what is it that we can do. The most important thing I want to say is I think that we can fix this. Um, I know that we can fix this. Um, last almost 20 years, I spent running a social investment fund that was extending affordable capital to independent media companies in the developing world. Um, it is very difficult. We, over 16, 17 years, extended more than $100 million in different types of financing. Mm -hmm. And over 16 or, 17 million, or 16 or 17 years, lost only 2% of, we had 2% of unrepaid investments. So based on that experience, people ask me, so what is it that we need to invest in independent media? And what I would say after understanding, looking at these numbers and understanding them, I would say that the first thing that we need is brand new thinking. We need to reset our thinking. And if you remember, I guess there's some people of my generation who will remember that PCs used to look like fridge in your room of, of uh, uh, that small bar. They were like these huge boxes, but they had that special button, and you press the button, and your screen goes black, and then that green light starts blinking, and the computer starts from the beginning. That is what we need to do with protecting uh, press freedom. So to be very specific, we need to do a lot of things, but I think I have time to point out only three. The first thing that I think we need to do is we need to expand the mandate. We need to re rethink what our mandate is. We all keep talking about protecting press freedom. I actually think we should talk about developing first and then protecting press freedom. Um, I think that independent media companies and small companies working in these difficult environments have right to, affordable, to, ac to access to affordable capital. They have right to education on the latest media technologies. And reversing the lingo and would, would reverse what we actually do. The second thing I think we need to do is we need to create alternative funding mechanisms um, and to explain that in the somewhat simplified way, I would say, think about European Union that decides that they want to increase production of corn. So what they do is they make this comprehensive plan that includes anything from grants for uh, research and development to uh, small companies, how that can be done, to no interest loans, concessionary loans, equity investments, so the whole range of different things and different types of financing, and that is what we have to do with independent media if we plan to, to, to do something to, to develop it. Um, and last is actual um, fact that there is no there is no um, conditions free money to invest in media in the developing world. And I'll repeat that. I am pretty sure, spending two decades in that space, 
that there is a very limited number of organizations that are actually providing that, and that money that exists over there is just one drop in the ocean of a need. So what we need to do is we need to invent that money. We need to find this ideal investor. We have to find somebody who is going to be politically neutral, who will be acceptable, who is not going to be motivated by financial returns, and who would be willing to take all of those risks investing in places like that. And I think I found that. And that is all of us. That is all of us, a crowd formerly known as audience, living in these 14%, 14% of us, I believe, have an obligation to put a little bit of our uh, funds into um, assisting those remaining 86%. To be very specific, this is what I have in mind. Let's imagine that just 50 of us over here together would put $1,000 each and give a loan to a radio station in Mozambique. That would make $50,000, would actually buy one studio. Uh, it's probably enough, 50, 50 of us with $1,000, is probably enough to build a small radio station in Burma. Let's switch gears and do it in a different way. Let's imagine for a second that Canadian media company decides to put aside $50,000 of their profit at the end of the year and say that they understand that corporate social responsibility is uh, uh, spending those $50,000 by helping other media in other countries, their corporate social responsibility. They can even engage their readers and listeners to select where to put that money. The next step would be that all media companies of Canada get together and create a $2 million fund of you know, corporate social responsibly uh, investment fund of Canada, and so on, and so on, and so on. So, I can go on uh, uh, daydreaming. The beauty of this thing is that in, in the fact that it actually allows endless number of combinations in between different individuals and, and institutions and investors. I will leave it there. I just think it would be fair to finish where I started. I feel like we failed Mikhail Beketov because we did not do right things that would have protected him. And I hope that we will press that reset button and that we will get it right this time. Thank you.